Good day, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. My name is Terry Martin. I'm with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. Thank you all for joining us for the very first in our Emergency Management EM Geoforum series. The first topic, which we are really excited to get to focus on, is search and rescue. You'll be hearing from a few different folks from FEMA and the NAVSIG team, and we'll do those introductions in just a minute. However, uh, on the logistics side, I'm joined by Charlotte Abel from the NAPSIC team. She'll be keeping us on track time-wise and monitoring the Q&A window. And if time allows, we will select uh, a few to go through at the end. Now, this is a part of a virtual seminar series that we are facilitating on behalf of the Response Geospatial Office within the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And we're partnering to further this shared vision of advancing emergency management through the promulgation of best practices and the integration of innovative technology and solutions in day-to-day -day operations. Um, we have uh, a number of topics that we are really excited that will be coming down the pike for EMTO Forum. And uh, if you've registered for the event, which I'm sure you have if you're on, you'll be getting those details um, following this session. And uh, you can always check back on our web page shown here uh, for future events, including uh, future EM geoforums that will be coming down the pike. Um, and I wanted to mention that these sessions are really going to be developed in tandem with the Modeling and Data Working Group. This is really a tremendous group. They meet monthly on different topics. Um, so you are free to join those when you wish, when the topic is interesting to you or just to listen. And they're doing some really good work. So we'll be working in, uh, in tandem with them over the next year. So I would advise you to join the email list and find out what they're doing. Now I'd like to do a sound check. Uh, were we able to get Chris Vaughn audio? Take a second. Can you hear me? Hello, Terry. I can hear you. Thank you so much. Um, I was hoping at this point, you know, we'd like to turn it over to you, Chris. Uh, Chris is the Geospatial Information Officer with FEMA, and uh, you really are the one who had the vision behind the series. Uh, so I want to turn it over to you to get it kicked off on both just the search and rescue topic that we'll be discussing today, but also kind of the vision of the EMGO Forum moving forward. So with that, I'll just turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Terry, and and really thank you everybody for dialing in. Right, we've got <clears throat> nearly 150 participants at least on the line, maybe even more dialing in. So uh, this has already been a success, and so um, our hope is to establish a rhythm with these training forums, specifically to reach a broader audience. Uh, the the concept of location-based technologies, you know, we've been using the words geospatial or GIS. Um, is is such a powerful concept. What we're trying to do is really broaden this this capability, right? It's your smartphone. You're you're carrying around this amazing capability in your hip pocket. This mini supercomputer in your hip pocket. Just take a photo, <laughs> you know. And so uh, that's really the goal of these forums, specifically starting out with urban search and rescue. Why? Because they've been at it for a really long time and they've come so far. I mean, I personally was on the ground for Hurricane Katrina and had we had some of the tools and capabilities, you know, 13, 14 years ago, uh, how much more effective would we have been from a response perspective? So um, I'm really excited about today. I'm very grateful that we're in a partnership with NAPSIG on things like this. Um, we're really looking forward to your feedback on how we did after the end of this. Uh, but just keep in mind, we're trying to broaden this. This is not supposed to be a, a brief from a GIS guy to a GIS guy or gal. This is supposed to be a mechanism that we can sh share this great technology with a much broader, wider audience uh, and, and you know, use the technologies that are at your uh, disposal, right at your fingertips. Uh, and so that's, that's the purpose and vision for where we're coming from with all this. So thank you. I hope you enjoy today. We're looking forward to your feedback. Thank you for participating. Back over to you, Terry. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris, for that welcome and for sharing your vision for really enabling this entire community. Uh, I would like now to introduce you to our esteemed panelists. 
From the NAPSIC team, we have Paul Doherty. Paul has a long history in search and rescue beginning in his days as a park ranger in Yosemite National Park in 08. And from there, he began his career utilizing GIS for public safety in a, a number of positions, including search and rescue technician. And he's also heavily involved in the SAR GIS community, supporting their annual working group session, the SAR field data collection working group, just to name a few of his efforts. Also with us today from NAPSIG is Jared Doak. He's a former tech info specialist for the Missouri Task Force One, and he's primary one of the primary editors of the Search and Rescue and First Responder Field Data Collection Survey 123 template that you'll all be seeing later today. We're also really excited to have Lance Gilmore and Adam Barker from FEMA. Lance is with the FEMA Urban Search and Rescue Branch, and he has been uh, the GIS liaison for the FEMA task forces as well as NGA for at least over a decade. And Adam is an expert in hydraulic modeling and impacts, but also has been integral with his work supporting the FEMA USAR task forces in a number of efforts, including developing a centralized data hosting repository, which is a huge leap forward. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, I would like to just kind of give you a brief um, talk about who we are for anyone who's new to the NAPSIG organization. The National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have a national network of over 20,000 members, both public safety and GIS practitioners alike, representing local, state, tribal, county levels. And we were formed over 10 years ago as an alliance between a number of prominent national associations, some of which you see here, and have evolved into a formal organization over the course of that time. But really our vision as an organization is listed here. And its core is to help build a nation of emergency responders and leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome of survivors and really working towards building a more resilient nation. And this graphic really represents how we are working towards that vision. And a large part of what we do really culminates in delivering a session like today. So sharing and encouraging the consistent use of best practices that we have developed through our work with mission partners like FEMA and search and rescue task forces across the country to develop standards, test them through exercises and sometimes real world disasters. And we continue to refine those based on stakeholder feedback and lessons learned and then provide education and training and resources free to the community and or do some tech transfer and often it's through partnerships like what we were doing today with FEMA, ultimately with the goal to build the capacity of the community. So of course you can visit our site for more information and get access to those resources. And our panel is going to share exactly where to go following the seminar for specific content and tools that support search and rescue. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Paul to get us started. Great, and how do you copy? Loud and clear, thank you. Great. So today we've got four real objectives and this is what we measure our success against. Uh, number one is to learn about the purpose of, you know, why are we doing search and rescue data collection and the ways in which this data can be used. We want to learn a little bit more about the methods and ways to integrate them into your organization. So it'll be a bit of a call to action at the end. Learn how to develop a game plan to take the data and technology and, and make it actionable and then gain insight into FEMA's timeline and geospatial strategy for search and rescue. And we'll hear from Lance and Adam on that a bit later. So we'll start with the, the why. So why is it important to um, capture what's going on in the field? And I think the, the word that appears in most people's heads these days is situational awareness. And I like to say, it's more than doing documentation. It's more than dots on a map. Uh, one of the reasons we want to collect information in the field is it provides a platform for real-time situational awareness and collaboration. Uh, and to put that into words you all might be saying is, you know, I can see where other SAR teams have already searched and what's needed in the field. I don't have to guess. Enhanced data collection and reporting. I can see what's already been accomplished and make predictions on how much time and resources it'll take to complete the operation. Improve search strategy and tactics. For all of you that have taken uh, various uh, search training, whether it's missing person search or what we're talking about today, disaster response, there's a lot of theory and thought that goes into it. But using field data collection allows us to actually say, I can see what areas have been covered and what areas remain to be searched. And then finally, from an operational intelligence standpoint, I can now identify the high priority tasks and assign them to the appropriate teams. And this isn't to say we weren't doing this before, 
But given the scale of disasters, uh, given the Hurricane Harveys, but also given the demands of our day-to-day -day tasks, we now know through you know, digital data collection, we can actually accomplish these and answer these questions with what we're all really looking for, right? More confidence that we are uh, helping survivors. So, you know, this involves, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, but just developing some common language around search and rescue. Uh, one of the things you'll see today in our uh, the data collection template we've set up is there's really four bins of, of things we're collecting in the field, four categories. And those are human interactions. Those are things like, you know, uh, people sheltering in place, people that need rescue, people that we have rescued, structure damage, um, and not so much structure damage as a building inspector, but as a firefighter or law enforcement, you know, is it safe to go into that building? We identify hazards in the field, things like ro roadblocks um, or hazmat. And then support, what are the, what are the, what's the operational intelligence we need to know where we can land a helicopter? or where we can set up casualty collection points. And so uh, we've looked at how a lot of people have been doing this in the field, including FEMA, state search and rescue teams, international search and rescue advisory group. And we've boiled it down to these four categories and you'll see where this fits in later, but it helps to have some common language. Um, another common language we need to talk about is, you know, location language. So using US national grid, that's really the very basic foundation of, uh, of the way we communicate location and search and rescue. So starting with Hurricane Florence was the first time that uh, NAPSIG and the International Association of Fire Chiefs, we teamed up uh, following the, the Hurricane Harvey season. And we, we deployed a system that would allow us to collect data across state lines um, in a way that we could understand each other's location language. And this, this involved a monumental effort, um, many, many thousands of surveys done in the field and across those four broad categories. So we can filter our maps, right? We can look at just where are the human interactions, but we can also look at things like where is the damage being seen and share that with appropriate, uh, appropriate agencies. Also, you know, in Hurricane Michael, for instance, we had a large uh, deployment of both state SAR. Um, so teams re responding within their state or being requested through EMAC, but also FEMA search and rescue teams. So here's a picture if we only uh, had state SAR data collection. Here's a picture if we only had FEMA USAR data collection. But by bringing these things together, we can form a better situational awareness picture. Uh, a lot of people talk about a common operating picture, but I like the term common operating platform because uh, pictures are static and we know the situation is very, very dynamic. So, you know, it's just about one team, you know, one fight. And when we talk about interoperability, when us GIS people talk to each other, we're talking about things at like a data level, but we're also talking about interoperability at the human level. So as I showed before, this allows us the ability to collaborate with SAR teams across agencies. It also allows us to integrate with existing platforms, like using the US national grid for our location language. It allows us to integrate with tools that maybe you're still using today, like uh, GPS data collection tools, like we'll hear about from Jared. It also allows us to integrate with other platforms at a national, state, local, or even at a volunteer level, right? Because we're putting information on a map. And it allows us to integrate with other tools you might be using like messaging and command and control platforms. By putting on a map, we're allowing ourselves to communicate across technologies and agencies. And I think that's really key. From an emergency manager standpoint, uh, why is this valuable? What well, allows us to integrate with other emergency management agencies and their processes. Uh, the first one that comes to mind for a lot of us is damage assessment. And this is uh, a now famous slide from Chris Vaughn, where if we look at a house, a dwelling, these, each of these little stick figures are the type of inspector that might show up after disaster. And um, this is a problem for lots of reasons. A waste of, you know, could be a potential waste of time and money. But also it's not really helping the survivor do what they want to do most, which is recovering it back on their feet. Well, if we don't do a good job with that first stick figure off to the left, the urban search and rescue, we set up uh, delays and, and um, wasted time and wasted uh, efforts in the rest of the process. And so being as first responders are the first ones there collecting information, we want to make sure that information gets used in the most appropriate but most wide ways possible. And then finally, again, that, that interoperability at the human level, which is really just cru crucial. This is from a training we just did uh, this week in South Car Carolina. 
And we were able to take information from all these different agencies, right? Local fire that were working right in Columbia, local fire that were working in, in Greenville, South Carolina, um, the state search and rescue team, and feed it to the state emergency management division, right? Feed it into the state EOC and the state EOC in return can provide all those first responders with the information they need, like flood models. Uh, and the best part is we're doing it in conjunction with FEMA Urban Search and Rescue, who may be supporting at an incident support team level, they may be supporting with boots on the ground. And this one team, one fight approach really comes together when you actually do an interagency exercise like we did this week. From a, also from an interoperability standpoint, we all know that emergency management's a moving topic, a uh, moving target. And one of the more common and uh, more recent topics raised is lifelines. Lifeline enables continuous operation of government functions and critical businesses, right? And this is the topic of uh, pulling together different sectors of information and putting them into these seven functional categories. Well, if we're doing field data collection and for a lot of FEMA teams, they may be doing more of a recon or a damage assessment by, um, thinking, by thinking carefully about the core information needs, the data that's being collected in the field, we can align with these categories and help everyone with their, with their mission. So those are just a couple of examples of, of the, the benefits and the purpose. I think for a lot of you, it's gonna depend on who you are, but for boots on the ground, it's really about situational awareness. And I think that's, uh, that's a, key, a key thing to keep in mind as we go forward today. With, uh, with that, I'd like to just make it a little more tangible and Jared's going to show us what, what is it we're talking about? What does it mean to do modern field data collection? And uh, we'll just do a quick comms check. Jared, are, are you with us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, loud well, and clear. All right, we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna start with kind of, uh, I guess the beginning of search data collection for USAR. And, and really that was um, after Hurricane Katrina with uh, Garmin GPS and the iron sights methodology. Um, this was really uh, kind of the first uh, holistic approach to field data collection. And it established a standard process uh, that was followed by all uh, federal teams and was also adopted by a lot of uh, state and local teams. Next slide. And as part of that, um, teams would go out and they would, they would collect tracks and waypoints uh, with the GPS and it, it's established um, search definition. So they knew what level of detail they were doing on each of their searches. Um, you can see the examples here. And it also gave them uh, kind of a standard symbology so that when you're looking at these tracks on a uh, common operational platform, uh, you, could, you can see um, exactly the level of search that was uh, taking place. Next slide. Um, it also established uh, 24 standard uh, waypoints to be used during urban search and rescue, and these were really um, kind of the things that were, were most used. Um, you have the structure damage assessments, uh, victim, victims, hazards, and then also there were some extra ones uh, that could be assigned by incident. And now with um, advances in technology, uh, both in kind of application development and also in um, smart devices, we're now able to transition from a GPS to um, a product called Survey123. Um, and this is an Esri-based app. Uh, next slide. And this app, it's, uh, it can be used on Android, iOS, or Windows devices, and even desktop computers. And it, it's nice because it can work on smartphones, tablets, um, basically any smart device that you have. And it's a form centric uh, solution. And a lot of, some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, your department may be using it for uh, fire hydrant testing or smoke alarm blitzes, but you can create forms. Um, any, basically any form that you have can be turned into an electronic form that you, you can fill out on your, on your device. And that's what we've done with uh, the urban search and rescue data. Um, the forms also have a uh, skip logic and uh, they, you can set defaults, so it makes it easier for the actual user uh, to work through the form. Um, and it allows you to analyze the results very quickly, so you don't have to uh, do much processing of the data. There's a, Paul will show a little bit later, there's a, a page you can just go to that'll automatically sort and filter the data for you. 
And the survey one, two, three, as we've kind of said before, is part of the larger ArcGIS platform. So the data you're collecting using the survey one, two, three app, it can be edited and manipulated in, in other Esri apps, as well as desktop applications on your computer. Next slide. All right. And uh, some of the benefits of Survey123 over the GPS for urban search and rescue, um, as I said before, there's kind of the smart form logic. So depending on the waypoint you choose, uh, it can change the follow-up question. So you're not looking at a really long form for every waypoint. You're only filling out the critical information uh, for what you're, what you're looking at. It also gives you automatic field calculations. Um, so if you pick a, a structure waypoint, it'll, it can mark that um, as, as being a structure icon. Um, and it, it, just, it just simplifies data uh, completion. Um, it also allows you to easily project waypoints. So this is possible on a Garmin GPS, but um, without a good base map, it's really hard to uh, put a waypoint where you want. A good example of uh, this, is it would be a, a, if there was a hazmat incident, you could be away from that incident and see where it's at and then uh, physically move your pin to that location. Or if you're walking around in a, a, a residential area, um, one person could be walking down the middle of the street. And instead of, uh, like with the GPS, usually when you hit, hit uh, mark a waypoint, instead of putting that waypoint in the middle of the street, you could actually move the pin to the rooftops of the houses um, around you. It's also uh, in a connected environment. It's uh, near real-time data collection. So as you're collecting this information, uh, people back in the base of operations or in the incident command post, they can actually see where you're at and and see the data coming in as it happens. So you're not waiting until the end of your operational period to process the GPS data and then, and then submit it. And then you see that there's uh, victims in an area. You can see that near real time. Again, as I said earlier, it's integrated in the ArcGIS platform. So uh, people at the state EOC and at the, at the federal level, they can all be seeing this information as it's coming in. And then they can do analysis on that in more advanced uh, um, desktop applications. And it gives you the ability to collect more meaningful data. So with the GPS, um, essentially all you had was a waypoint icon telling you what was at that location. But with Survey123, filling out those additional fields, uh, you can get more information about what's actually go going on at that location. Location, And it gives you enhanced data sharing. So as Paul showed earlier, um, you, can, you can submit people from Cross state boundaries or federal agencies can all be seeing the same data. And I'll just add one thing to remember is, you know, in a disconnected environment, we're still able to collect data. It's just that uh, when, we, when we do have a connection, it really allows us to have more of a real time situational awareness. In a disconnected field environment, at least when we get back to the command post, uh, we can very quickly upload our data versus uh, in the past having to, having to work with a lot of different USB cables and other stuff to bring it in. So it, I guess in one sense, it helps you get to your, uh, your food and your bed more quickly. And that's, that has real value too. Yes, it, it definitely uh, decreases the workload on the tech info specialist. Um, another benefit of it is uh, we now have the ability to add additional waypoints. So instead of being confined to the 24 that were on the Garmin, we can add more. And so we've added, um, some support icons uh, such as incident command post, casualty collection point, staging, safety zone, um, and, a, and an, an additional hazard one. So if there's some other hazard, you could mark that. Uh, and I would like to note that it is backward compatible with Ironsight. So if uh, there is a team that is uh, still collecting uh, data using a GPS, um, you can import that information into this. And, and the Ironsight's uh, method, it's, it's, it's not going away uh, completely anytime soon. It, teams will still be using it. And we wanted to make sure that there was that interoperability. Um, so not only can we import into it, we can also export. So um, there's a simple interface where you can go in on the back end of Survey123 in a website, and you can export that data into a CSV XLS, um, Shapefile Geodatabase, and even a KML, which you can pull into Google Earth um, for those teams that are, are comfortable working in that. I would like to note, though, that 
once you do that export, that data is no longer live. So you do, if you're a team that is doing that, you need to have a plan for uh, continually updating that, um, that export. And I this, guess the key takeaway there, Jared, is like, you know, if, if, if you've got workflows, you're used to using the tools you've used in the past, you can adapt to that um, and still use this, this newer approach. And I think that's, it is really important for a lot of us. So it's uh, thanks Jared for making that, that possible. Yep. And uh, it also provides the opportunity for remote assistance. This is, this is one of my uh, favorite slides. I'd, in November, I went to SUSAR training in Wichita and I did a survey one, two, three training. And uh, it just so happened that uh, Paul was meeting with the Survey123 team in Redlands at the same time. So as we were collecting data, um, you can see that that's Ismail uh, Shvite. He's the kind of product owner of the Survey123. And Jonathan Glassman, he's a structure specialist with California Task Force 6. And Jeff Monder, um, Fire Rescue New Zealand and in Sarag. They were all sitting in the same room in Redlands uh, looking at the data as it was coming in and Paul was able to send me text messages saying, Hey, you're getting some GPS bounce on this or why, why is this waypoint the way it is? Uh, you should go check on that. Um, so it was, it was really cool to be, be halfway across the country and be getting input from, from four experts that were, um, clear in another state in real time. All right. Um, now going to move on and we're going to talk um, about the the survey form itself so as i said earlier survey one two three can it can bring in multiple different um forms but we created one specifically for urban search and rescue so go on the next slide and the the form we're using now um it was initially started um right after Hurricane Harvey, as Paul said, uh, Terry was, and Jeff Doolin from IFC, they were kind of the first ones to, to start this form. And then um, the NAPSIG Search and Rescue uh, Data Collection Working Group kind of took it on and, and we've, we've evolved and we've uh, taken feedback from the community that's been using it and, and we've updated it ever since. Um, it is now the current version uh, six is what we're currently uh, in production with, and we're testing version seven, but uh, version six been adopt, has been adopted by uh, FEMA USAR and also IFC uh, um, agencies. And um, we have a deployment kit that's available on our uh, uh, SARGIS hub page, which I will show you in a little bit. Um, so it, it's available to be deployed uh, within your organization. I think Paul's gonna talk about that some more later. Yeah, and, and one important point here, I guess, is, uh, you know, while we're talking about what's new, we built on top of a foundation of, of many people who've uh, worked really hard to put this together. And, you know, Dave Weber and others from FEMA have uh, worked tirelessly to make sure that data collection was a thing that search and rescue teams can do. And we're trying to take the best of that and, and work with them to, to move it forward. I also did want to mention, um, while IFC and NAPSIG have worked hard uh, past two years on this, you know, this really all started during Hurricane Harvey out of a, you know, an unprecedented event. And that involved uh, even Terry Martin on the line who, who had to build some of these things on the fly. And, and that proved out what was possible. And now we've come back and looked at best practices and the core information needs and, and the survey you see today as a result of, of all those efforts. So I just wanted to chime in there, Jared, sorry. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, so if you have a, a smart device. We're not going to do a live demo today, but if you have a smart device, you can scan that QR code and see um, what we've been working on in, on version seven. So this is a testing version seven, um, not in production yet, but we're um, we're trying out some new things since last hurricane season, taking some feedback from um, a bunch of different agencies. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to touch base on some of the updates that you'll see in version seven over a version six that you may have used in a uh, in a past hurricane. Um, so the, if you look at number one, we added a couple fields uh, like search type and uh, operational period. And again, this, is, this helps with importing that GPS data. So it just makes it, it easier to uh, append uh, some data that comes in from uh, Garmin GPS. Um, look at number two, this isn't an update we made to 
the form itself, but the Survey123 application has been updated and it now includes uh, the ability to look at um, a web map that uh, you've created. So here we, you can see a, a search segment that we, we created and you can also see points that are being added around you if you're in a connected environment. Um, there are some offline workflows, um, but those are going to be de um, developed further, um, I think, here in the near future. If we look at number three, this is probably the biggest change that we've made um, in this version, and it's the addition of this follow-up field and a follow-up priority. Uh, so we were afraid that points would start getting, when you start getting thousands and thousands of points, uh, things start getting lost in the shuffle. And we wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. Uh, so we created this follow-up field and Paul's gonna walk you through um, the dashboard and, and how, how they, um, you kind of can assign and address some of these issues. Um, but it just allows you to say, this is an important issue, someone needs to follow up on it and it is critical to life safety. Um, next, um, again, the QR code's there if you still wanna try looking at it. Um, one of the other things we added was uh, reverse geocoding. So basically this is, um, you can see in that address location field there, uh, I didn't have to type that in. It uh, automatically pulled that information based on my GPS coordinate. Uh, so that's kind of a, a nice thing to add uh, for people in the field, a little less data entry, it's automatically uh, calculated. And then next, uh, this was from uh, direct feedback from South Carolina. They wanted to uh, be able to figure out how many animals there were. So if you choose an animal issue as your waypoint, you get follow-up questions for the number of animals and then uh, an issue comments field. So here we see uh, we have two animals, uh, there are two dogs that need rescued and one is aggressive. Uh, so we're able to input that information. And, and we, we left the count comments field um, those would be easy to do calculations on in your dashboard, but it also leaves a little bit of flexibility with the comments field that you can, can kind of put in information you want. And then looking at number six here, this isn't uh, necessarily an update uh, from the previous one, but it's always something I'd like to point out, especially uh, for people in, within FEMA. Uh, we do have a lifelines category. So as teams are out in the field, if they have time, it's an optional um, a field they can collect. Um, they can say if, if the issue is affecting a lifeline and then up at the regional or national level you can build lifeline dashboards based on this information. Um, as I said, uh, Esri has several apps that, that work um, with this data. Another app we are currently testing is Quick Capture and Think of uh, Survey123 as collecting waypoints and Quick Capture uh, we're currently using for collecting tracks or lines. Um, so when you first open your project, um, you can enter your team name. So your team name will be associated with all the data collected. And then you have this track log. So if your team is assigned a hasty search, um, all you have to do is tap hasty and you can uh, start collecting data and it will start recording your track. When you tap hasty again, it will stop that recording of uh, where you've been and it will submit it. Uh, the green button down there, the live tracking continuous points, that's something we're testing where um, it continually sends uh, points as you're out in the field uh, in a connected environment. And the, it also has the ability to um, use points. So this may be something that could be used during um, like a very quick uh, recon phase or if you had to fly in a helicopter over an area doing a uh, rapid damage assessment, um, it allows you to just tap the button to drop that waypoint. And we also have the ability to have one follow-up question. So for victims, uh, the follow-up question is the number of people and for damage surveys, as in number four, um, the follow-up is a picture. So you can say it's a structure that's destroyed and then take a picture of it. Next slide. And then this is kind of, um, these are tracks here that, that Paul's created. Uh, so you can see what they look like in a map. Um, next, all right. And uh, one other app we've been testing um, is Explorer. And you think of Explorer as kind of your navigation app. Uh, so you can 
open your 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 SAR map on there. Um, it has the ability to do offline areas on the fly, so you can designate an area and download it before you go into an area of no connectivity. Um, also mentioned that some teams like New York Task Force One and Ohio Task Force One, they've been um, exper experimenting with a, another app that's similar, but it's a collector. Um, so it, it has similar functionality as well. All right, next slide. All right, now I think I'm gonna turn it over to Paul and he's gonna kind of talk about some of the supporting applications. Great, thanks a lot, Jared. So uh, for some of you that, that haven't used these apps, uh, you know, it can be a lot of technology we're talking about, but the, the core thing that we've worked on is the workflow and the template that's used for data collection. And these apps all are built off of that. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, to give you an idea of ease of use, you know, Survey123, we have just-in-time training videos that uh, people can watch in about 10 minutes and be out in, the deal, out in the field collecting data. Quick capture, Jared and I just did our first test of uh, putting it on a phone, handing it to an ATV driver in the middle of the woods and saying, hey, we're gonna track you with this, just press this button when you're done. And that was like more like a 30 second briefing in the rain. So um, while it looks like all new stuff, I think as you get hands on, you'll see it's actually uh, very easy to use, especially if you focus on, on who needs what. So when I say supporting applications, it's sort of, you know, what are you doing with the data? Because in the past, we were using waypoints in a way to kind of document our work, but we didn't necessarily have a way to use them to inform our own uh, decision making. So <clears throat> one of the key things here is the concept of having a dashboard. And a dashboard is both a concept, but in this case, I'm actually showing you an app called Dashboard. And the dashboard can be configured. And when I say configured, I mean like, uh, a person can change what it looks like on the fly. Um, this dashboard was configured to take advantage of the, uh, the follow-up workflow. In the case where there are many, many victims that may need, uh, may need rescue, you don't want them to slip through the cracks of a bunch of dots on a map. We actually made it more like a, uh, some people call it a Kanban board, but basically uh, as reds come in, things that need follow-up come in, we need to resolve them. And the goal is to either assign them or they get completed in the field. And at the end of the day, we have no more reds or yellows. And again, this is one of those things that'll make more sense once you get hands-on with our, with our sandbox. And we uh, tested that this week in South Carolina and learned a lot from it. But, you know, dashboards are going to be different based off of the audience. And while I don't think we want 300 different dashboards on an incident, uh, someone in a EOC or in a support role at a, at a centralized place may not need the same level of detail as someone who's just trying to report by the numbers and assess progress. And so here's an example of a dashboard configured on top of the data that is much more high level and almost gives us like our SIT report. But instead of waiting for the end of the operational period, we're getting a SIT report <clears throat> in real time. And you know, there's other needs in the field. Like we may actually have to do on our own uh, some assigning of areas. Um, we may be trying to understand where people are collecting data in terms of uh, US grid and others. And so these are, this is an application called the, uh, it's based off of what's called ArcGIS Web App Builder. But for, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's designed to help manage Intel. And it even has an editing capability where we can go in and edit things like waypoints or our, uh, our assignment areas. And so this is something that uh, probably not the incident commander is gonna be using, but probably more down at that SIT unit or planning and operations level. And uh, something that's very easy, a tool that's very easy to use. But um, while I said it's more about making decision making in the field now and, and we can actually have situational awareness, we also have a need for reporting. And so um, the word 214 gets thrown around a lot in different, uh, different exercises. And yes, there is an ability to automate reports that come out of the system so that you can close out your, your shift um, or your incident action plan as, as needed. So um, reporting can be done at a, a summary level. This is using the survey one, two, three um, backend. Um, so I know people like pretty charts and graphs. This is a place you can get that. But as an Intel person, um, you can actually dig all the way down to a point and see what's the photo that was added what was the direction it was taken in and uh, you know, what was the uh, device used. And so it really depends on the audience what you're gonna get out of this approach. And that's, uh, 
the great part about it being flexible. Now with flexibility um, comes great responsibility, right? We need to have a game plan to support this approach. What the, I, I like to call it a geospatial game plan, but it's like a playbook, right? Um, what the SAR working group has worked on is, you know, what are the core information needs uh, for search and rescue? Well, the good news is we were able to use an existing standard, the Ironsides method. But we also listened to many, many AARs and went to many exercises and events and said, well, the iron sites was the beginning and here's some of the follow-up information that's needed. So we've done a lot of that hard work so you don't have to create this uh, system from scratch. We've also begun to develop game plans for addressing those needs. So how do you explain this to an emergency manager? How do you explain this uh, from a training standpoint to a field operator? We've gone through a lot of that hard work already. Um, we'll, we'll come back to this at the end, but what's up to you as an agency is, you know, where are you going to host this platform? Um, who's the team that's going to support it, right? Because technology is great, but you still need people who understand how it works, like your GIS or tech info specialist. You want a trainer on your team who can help train um, not just once a year, but anytime there's spare time, help people uh, learn how to use the system and understand what they get out of it. And you need a champion, someone who can, on your team, who can actually say, here's the real world benefit of moving this way. Um, and I think of those sometimes as three different people and I'm seeing it emerge on a lot of teams. Uh, for instance, like uh, California Task Force Six has about three people who are really excited about this and work together and bring different skills to the table to roll out their trainings. Um, and we need to consider, you know, who gets access to this. We don't want to collect a bunch of really useful data for damage assessment. And then during the incident, let emergency management know that we're collecting the data. We want to have a game plan for that in advance. And that involves having, uh, you know, data sharing agreements in place, but also the technical bits to make sure that they can pull this into their common operating platform. And this is something that, uh, you know, through our, uh, support from DHS Science and Technology. We're working through these game plans as templates by working with uh, teams in South Carolina, a team in Colorado, to say, all right, here's a good boilerplate template that you can use on your team. And so um, that's something that we'll make available to the community. And uh, Jared, Jared can talk a little bit more about this and FEMA as well, but you know, we're trying to make this as easy as possible to get started. And for this reason, we're standing up a, uh, a hub page. We think this is gonna be a good approach for teams um, to centralize the data collection is just have a one-stop shop for all of the apps and uh, training materials. The NAPSIG hub page, which is like a, a sandbox that you can use, we're listing the resources by role. So who are you? Are you, a, are you a GIS or a tech info specialist? Are you a field operator or are you uh, someone that's typically gonna be in the command post or the EOC making decisions off of the data. So um, the points of contact that we've uh, had over the years, you know, we're trying to centralize that information, whether it's uh, the FEMA, urban search and rescue leaders, which you'll hear from in a minute, uh, International Association of Fire Chiefs, or um, in the future, what we're really working towards is more of a, a cross agency geospatial working group by working with the National Search and Rescue uh, Committee. And then finally on the website that uh, we're sharing with you, there's a sandbox where you can get hands on with all this, not for real world response, but you can test these tools and see how they work together. Um, you can do that. I see some people adding points to our dashboard right now, but you can do it when we get off the call or over the ne next coming weeks. And I think you know, one of the key things that we've learned, um, sounds silly, but to, to make the system successful is to just make something simple like a battle card. If you're going to roll out, uh, you know, two or three apps, we just put it on a, it basically a, a printable sheet, and we say these are the three uh, forms you're using. Don't worry about anything else. Or these are the three apps you're using, and um, by doing that, you really ease the uh, the stress levels of the field operators, and you can get them out the door very very quickly. Uh, so we'll make that as a template that you can use. Now, before we introduce our next speakers, I just wanted to talk to. You know, how do you get started? What does it really, what does this all mean? FEMA is already using this platform um, over the past year and they're gonna be continuing to support it this year. And they're using the same templates that we're talking about today. And uh, we'll introduce Adam and, and Lance in a moment to speak to that. So if you're a FEMA USAR team, you should already know where to go. 
Um, if you're not a FEMA team, uh, you have sort of two options. You can work with a third party. Um, in the past, we've worked with International Association of Fire Chiefs to host this and, um, and support it, or you can host it yourself. And when we say host it yourself, ideally this would be done because we're talking about disaster response, it'd be done at a state or regional level. If every single town and county hosts this approach themselves, you need uh, a quarterback or someone who can organize it and bring it all back together. And so we're really recommending a, a state SAR coordinator and a state uh, GIS coordinator should get together to, uh, to discuss this. So those are, your, those are your options. And I just think that might be helpful for those of you who are trying to get started. So um, I think for everyone's benefit, it really makes sense to turn it over to uh, FEMA from here to hear an update from them. Um, so you kind of know a little bit about what their game plan is and their progress. And uh, it's always good to uh, bring Lance and Adam on to, uh, to talk about this because FEMA's come a really long way and are uh, doing a great job to support those in the field. So with that, I'll turn it over to Adam and Lance. Thanks, Paul. Hey, it's Lance. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, uh, back in May, uh, we adopted Survey 123. Uh, soon after that, uh, we opened up, uh, made funding available to our task forces to purchase the devices to support it. Uh, Chris Vaughn just joined us. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, uh, fortunately, uh, it was a relatively slow hurricane season for us. We sent out a lot of uh, resources for Hurricane Dorian, but we didn't re receive any requests to use our resources. Uh, so uh, what we ended up doing is some ad hoc training. And that's just a snapshot that, uh, you know, while our task forces are still purchasing the equipment, you can tell at least everyone within our systems getting their hands on it. Next slide. Uh, since then, for formal training, uh, uh, the West Division held a meeting, and uh, they've been evaluating it. They've been working with NAPSIG, working with ESRI, evaluating some uh, additional functionality that's uh, going to come out in the next version, and uh, that's really what's driving it right now. We don't have a search subgroup or a formal ad hoc that's uh, dr driving our progress right now. Um, coming up, the West Division has another workshop, and it's going to target uh, additional uh, task force members and then that's going to look at the the most recent uh, improvements and then hopefully we'll socialize that with the rest of the system and we hope that uh, the central and the east division get to offer the similar training to their uh, task force members next slide and then also uh, recently for puerto rico florida task force two and the incident support team deployed there um, there were no requests for assistance from, uh, the, from Puerto Rico. However, as you can see, uh, they were able to, to test it. Uh, FEMA did use some of that data and, uh, you know, that, that was uh, deployed easily with uh, little or no uh, introduction and training. And uh, as far as I know, it's been a success. Uh, for future stuff, for uh, how we're going to share additional training and uh, deliver additional training, as you said earlier, uh, we're going to deploy a hub site and other stuff, and I'll let uh, Adam comment on our plans for that. All right, next slide, please. So this is, uh, this is Adam Barker. I just want to give an update quickly about where we are right now, the current state of uh, FEMA, USAR, and then where we hope to be uh, in the near future. So we will adopt the, the new NAPSIG version 7 uh, survey once it's out of the training phase. Uh, we are He's still using the 2019 version, and so they, they did use that in Puerto Rico. That's the version 6. Um, once the new schema is out, I'm going to completely get rid of the, or not get rid of it, but wipe all the data on the practice dashboard uh, that we use for the, the FEMA teams, and uh, we'll, we'll start from uh, start new. And the, the biggest thing is we're going to develop a, a hub site which will uh, parallel the one that you see through uh, NASIG, uh, NAPSIG. And on there we'll have announcements. We're also going to have our uh, suite of dashboards. So we'll have uh, just the, the, the common operating picture or platform. We'll have the triage uh, dashboard as well. We'll have one for situational awareness, so weather, uh, inundation, death grids, all that kind of stuff, and one for editing. 
Uh, so it, like I said, it'll parallel the NAPSIG hub site, but it'll be the place for the SEMA teams to get all of the relevant information uh, and to find other documentation like SOPs and guidance for teams, uh, for GIS support of teams in the field, uh, all sorts of things. So my plan is to get most of that done in February. We have contractors right now that are working on our hub site. The dashboards themselves don't take too long to make, uh, but I'll I'm essentially waiting until the, uh, the version seven comes out, which should be in uh, March. But we'll we'll be able to to send updates or announcements via that hub site, and I believe the hub site, when it's live, will will be uh, will come out at, through a uh, USAR branch GM. That's it for me. Great, thank you, uh, Adam and Lance. I really appreciate your time today and. Uh, We've been really fortunate to be able to work across uh, both FEMA and state SAR agencies. And I think we're really uh, headed in the right direction and appreciate your, your leadership. All right, so we're, we're getting towards the end here. I'd like to get some time for questions. Uh, we may not be able to answer all of them today, but we could talk about maybe doing a, a Q&A document at the end. But um, what's next for us? So from the NAPSIG Search and Rescue Working Group, you know, we've reconvened. Uh, we initially came together after the Hurricane Harvey season to dial in the first version of the template. We're now up to version, version seven. I uh, imagine we'll do an update for next year, but the working group has been uh, a real good mix across all agencies, so FEMA and state and local. Uh, we have some volunteers on there, and we're also working with the International Search and Rescue Advisory Group to uh, align with what they're doing as much as possible and, and learn from what they've they've done as they're using a really similar approach with Survey123 and dashboards and others. Um, the adoption of the follow-up workflow is something that is new. It's not been trained before because if you think of what we've all been doing before, we've been putting dots on maps and looking at spreadsheets at the end of the day and relying on our you know more familiar practice of using radios and whiteboards. So this adoption of the workflow does not replace your skills in problem solving in the field, but it is a way to make the data a little more actionable. And so we're working through that with a few different exercises, but we're getting great feedback that this is something that people have wanted. Uh, we are looking into actually using GIS for what it's built for on the back end, uh, doing search data analytics. So how can we look at estimates to the percent of buildings searched in a search segment? I think now that we're actually collecting data in this format, we can bring more of a, almost a hackathon approach to understand what's possible with GIS, but we wanna make sure that the tools work first in the field. Uh, and you know, really important concepts like how can search and rescue data be used to begin the preliminary damage assessment process? It does not replace it. Firefighters are not uh, building inspectors uh, to the degree that the, you know, the building, uh, damage assessment program is, but they can use the information and we wanna make that as easy as possible. And then finally, uh, we've got some training videos. You'll see them on the website. They're short and sweet. Uh, they're really good for getting familiar. We do wanna update those and move from just videos on Survey123 and move into things like videos for training on uh, how to use a dashboard and maybe even more so important, uh, how to configure a dashboard. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is, you know, uh, we've been really fortunate through our support from DHS. On January 28th, we held a training exercise this week in South Carolina. We have another one coming up uh, February 20th in Colorado, and that helps to uh, test these things out and make sure they work not just for FEMA, but for, for state and local response as well. As far as uh, during disasters, one thing that you can do is uh, you can join the SAR Geospatial Working Group calls. We were hosting daily calls during major hurricanes, uh, and this will include stakeholders from FEMA, uh, NPS, uh, Coast Guard is always invited, SUSAR teams, and you know, supporting and relevant NGOs. Uh, we've, we've had participants from uh, you know, NAPSIG, IFC, Crowdsource Rescue, Humanity Road, et cetera, in the past, and we think that's really important. And uh, emergency management agencies to make sure they kind of know what, what's going on in that stage of the, uh, of the incident. We do keep a uh, SAR working group Slack channel that's available. So if you're someone who uses instant messaging through Slack, that's a good way to uh, jump in there and ask a quick question or access some links or discussion. And that's something that's worked really well for, for a bunch of us. So that's important. So I guess uh, 
in, in closing, really there's a call to action here and we need your help. We, we, you can help us by, uh, first of all, following the initiative itself. We are working on building out this website. It's like a hub page to the point where you can subscribe to it. Uh, for now, it's just a website you can visit. Uh, you can use that sandbox to train and send us your feedback and that's really helpful. Um, and you can share this information with uh, you know, your state SAR and GIS coordinators. I think uh, outside of FEMA, that's probably the next most important, or I should say uh, your next step is to make sure that your state search and rescue and GIS coordinators have the information they need to, to begin to set this up. Uh, I know there's a lot of locals trying to set this up on their own, but again, we reinforce the fact that uh, bringing it all together will provide more situational awareness. If you're interested uh, in, in staying in the loop on these things, we're building a, uh, a list of emails, so to speak. You can scan this QR code, or if it's uh, possible, Jared can paste this link in. Uh, that's a way to stay in touch with this community beyond just the, the EM Geo forums. And that's something we've used, uh, and, and usually we reply all to that during a disaster to establish the, the daily call. And with that, I just want to thank everyone. I really appreciate your help. Uh, this is, I feel like search and rescue, what could be more important than supporting that community and disaster? And it's really all coming together thanks to everyone's hard work here and especially those of you at FEMA and, and the NAPSIG team for helping to stand up this call. And I think I'll turn it back over to Terry for Q&A. Sure, I think, thank you so much, Paul and Adam and Lance and Jared and, Chris, for your time today. I know we're getting close to the hour mark, but a lot of really good questions came through. So if you'd like to stay on, um, we're going to try to adjust a few of those. And then, as you mentioned, Paul, which ones we don't get to, we'll probably uh, put together a Q&A document with all the materials from today. So anything that we don't have a chance to address today, we'll try to get that up on the site with the rest of the, uh, the, the materials. So, uh, Jared, uh, if you have your audio on, do you want to take a stab at a couple of the questions before we close out today? Um, yeah, I think um, a couple people, uh, Paul, have been talking about or asking about how this works um, with uh, workforce, um, if anybody's using workforce. And also someone had asked about Blue Force tracking uh, with assignment dispatching. Um, Great. I know South Carolina's been working with uh, workforce, but I'll let you kind of elaborate on that. And Yeah, I don't want to get uh, overly technical for everyone here, but Esri has uh, within that ArcGIS online platform, we're using uh, an application called Workforce, which is designed for doing uh, dispatch and assignment. We have tested that in the past, and it's certainly something that could be used in conjunction with this, but we wanted to build something that uh, would work on its own and align with uh, you know, search data methodology first. And then if people want to integrate with Workforce or even any other app, um, this is a uh, extensible platform and, and look forward to seeing how, it, how people use it. So yes, it, it can work with Workforce, but it can work without it as well. Yeah, um, a lot of people are asking about how they can get access to this, um, especially for training. Um, I'd like to point you to our hub page, uh, maybe uh, we can paste that in the chat here in just a second. Um, we, I, I, I'd want to make sure we're we're clear that our hub page is a sandbox, and it's testing currently testing out version seven of the survey, and it's for training purposes only, uh, not for real world response. But anybody's able to get on there if you want to do a a local training exercise with your team to see if this may be the right fit for you, or if, um, if it's something you want to pursue. Uh, please feel free to get on there and. Uh, get that and use it. Um, we also have links to the deployment kit. Uh, as I said earlier, it's currently version seven. Uh, after we do our exercise in Colorado um, and we finalize a few other things, we'll re release version seven as a deployment kit, but you can take that deployment kit. Um, you can, uh, there's step-by-step -step instructions on, on how you publish the survey. Um, and you can do that in your own organization infrastructure or, um, even better at the at a state level. Um, if you do do that, please uh, let us know that you're doing it so uh, we can assist you on that. Um, do you have anything to add on that, Paul? Yeah, I think uh, the key message here is uh, our first stakeholder for this were uh, FEMA, 
who already has uh, the technology in place and just were looking for guidance on how to set it up. Our second audience for this were state search and rescue teams that were already trying to do this and just needed guidance to set it up. How everybody else gets involved is something that, you know, uh, NAPSIG Foundation, IAFC, ESRI, we're all getting together to try to find the best way to support state, state search and rescue set this up. If you are entirely unaffiliated, you know, volunteer team, uh, you, you can work through the ESRI nonprofit organization program and you can still use all the templates and everything we talked about before. But again, always encourage people to realize that uh, if you want situational awareness, it has to be done in an organized way. Uh, it can be hosted centrally and distributed locally. Uh, if you're gonna host it yourself, unless you think your disaster is only gonna hit your specific area, you're gonna wanna coordinate with others around you. And that, that comes back to that geospatial game plan approach. Um, cool. Um, there's a question about, um... In North Carolina in 2018, you saw teams uh, were issued spot satellite devices. Has there been any, any review on that effort or published less, lessons learned? I'm not aware of any. Are you aware of any published lessons learned on that, Paul? Or No, and I'm hoping it wasn't Brian Barnes uh, that asked that question, because I would think Brian Barnes and uh, Chris Susi would be the ones to answer that. We were not involved in it. But spot is a device that works through satellite just for tracking. It's not to my knowledge, a data collection tool, but it is really useful for just live tracking, seeing where your boots boots on the ground are yeah. or boats uh, in the water. That kind of leads into another question several people have asked, uh, difference between quick capture and, and tracker. Um, I know they're, they're different. They're different apps. Uh, they kind of can do the same thing, but I'll let you uh, speak to the specifics on those. I know we've been, we've been testing quick capture ourselves and we've been speaking with other teams who've been uh, testing tracker. Great. So again, not to get overly technical, but Quick Capture is an app that you can test from our website and try out. Um, it's meant for very, very quick data collection. It also allows us to collect uh, data as lines, much like you were doing before with your GPS. You click start, you click stop, um, with the advantage that you could designate what type of search you're doing. So if I'm in a helicopter flying over, I can say I'm doing recon. If I'm doing a door-to-door -door search, I can say I'm doing you know primary or secondary um, and that really helps us understand it's more than a line on a map. It's giving us an understanding of how hard you're searching. Uh, Tracker at this point in time, to my knowledge, allows you to track. Um, it allows you to track in real time and it, it does a really nice job of that. But uh, to help at least FEMA with their existing workflows, we, we are working on quick capture right now and making sure there's a, a template to do that. So I know it's confusing. We live in an app world, but that's just the approach we've taken. And, uh, if anybody's testing tracker in this workflow, we really look forward to seeing what you're doing and, and learning from it. All right. Um, all right. One more quick question. Um, then I think we'll probably stop recording, but uh, Paul and I'll hang out for a little bit to try to answer any follow-up questions. Um, here, uh, here's a good one. Are, will you guys be at the Ezra UC, Paul? Go ahead. Oh, good question. Um, well, number one is at the National Security and Public Safety Summit, uh, there will definitely be some NAPSIC staff there potentially presenting. Um, so that's the weekend before the Ezra User Conference. I don't believe we'll have a booth this year, but probably more important than anything else, uh, we are trying to revive the NAPSIC Foundation social and we'll get details out to all of you um, when, when those details emerge. So that's great news and uh, really excited to, uh, to uh, make that announcement here. All right, thank you, Paul. Terry? Sure thing. So thank you guys for uh, staying on and answering some additional questions. We're gonna stop recording in just a moment, but before we do that, I wanted to thank our, our panelists and Chris Vaughn again for, for your time and putting this together. I hope for all of our participants, they found it informative and have some useful things to take back to your respective agencies and lessons learned, best practices, and some resources that you can start taking advantage of today. We also hope that you'll stay engaged with uh, these search and rescue efforts. As Paul mentioned, the success really relies on the valuable feedback of stakeholders like you who are participating today with all the work you do, um, your the boots on the ground, really the, the best uh, way for us to improve all the efforts that we are working on. So with that, enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you at a future EM Geo Forum. Thanks again. <laughs>